Please go ahead. Now. We are live now. Good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome. This is Darshana. I'm the nodal officer of SHM for the state of Goa and also working as assistant director for the development of the state. On behalf of my chairman, Sri Mangresh Pai Raikarji and co-chair Dr. Sagar Sargaonkar. And we also have with us our IT committee chair, Sri Mangresh Salilkar, sir. I welcome you all the special guests, guest eminent speakers, and all the participants who have joined and who will be joining later. So let me just say that we are here for a virtual conference titled uh, Injecting Technologies in the Ecosystem. And this uh, conference is named as Bridging a Gap Between the Academia, Industry and Government. So the objective of this conference is to explore the integ integration of technology to foster collaborations and innovations among academia, industry, and government stakeholders. I welcome you all the participants, and I would like to mention we have our guest speakers who are eminent and also relevant in the state of Goa. I would like to welcome uh, Professor Mridula Goel, ma'am, from Bitspilani, Goa campus, Dr. Vijay Borges, sir, or PMU, Government of Goa, I would also like to welcome Vijay Thomas, sir, CEO Tangentia, and Dr. Manuj Kamath, sir, Principal Dempo College. Hello. I welcome you all. And I would like to quickly highlight the focus. Uh, the highlights of this session would be on the technology inclusions, uh, education policy, <laughs> automation and digitization, strengthening the tech industry across Goa, technology progress and the future potential risk. To start and before we start, I would like our chairman, Mangrish Pai Raikar, sir, to please provide opening remarks. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be, uh, you know, here and I would compliment my IT chair, Mr. Mangrish Salilkar for spearheading this uh, event. And I'm sure that yeah, there are more in the offerings in the near future. All the eminent speakers, welcome to you. And we are obliged for you for giving your time, valuable time and the inputs for this important webinar, which uh, is injecting technology on the ecosystem. In fact, uh, you know, the government uh, of India has already made its mind very, very clear that technology would be the driving force in the times to come. The largest force and the driving engine of the Indian economy, that is MSME, needs a thrust of technology, needs a thrust of innovation, and needs a boost from the IT uh, counterparts. The reason being they can give them valuable inputs so as to improve their productivity, improve their standards, improve their caliber, and also improve their overall, you know, global uh, appreciation. The reason being, you know, today we are living in a era of globalization. It cannot be only for the locals. It has to be for the global because everybody needs to get value for money. And in that context, the IT uh, individuals can provide a lot of uh, inputs to this area, whereas they can, you know, uh, make improvements in the logistics, uh, in the cost cuttings, in the improvement of the product quality, and many more things which are in the, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the lines. In fact, I would, uh, I'm very much happy today that we have the stalwarts who have given inputs in this direction and are going to lend us their uh, valuable uh, words of wisdom, which would again lead to further, uh, you know, building up this ecosystem. In fact, technology has mostly played a crucial part in developing the modern world. And from the development of the wheel to the most recent advances in the artificial intelligence. 
In fact, in today's virtual conference, SHM intends to deliberate on knowing the issues and challenges faced with the objective to bring bridge a gap between and create a roadmap looking at making a positive way forward. I would request our eminent guest speakers to provide their fruitful insights and guidance during the panel discussion, which is being moderated by Mangirish Salilkar, my IT chair. And uh, SHM Goa Council assures you that uh, through our central uh, initiative, that is, I'm also a part of the central SHM body. So I can take it up at the central level, whatever suggestions that comes from your end. And I'm sure that we will together make a difference to the uh, industrial world, to the ecosystem. And I'm sure that this would be a guiding force to the next generation. So again, I welcome you all and thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Mangirish, sir. Thank you for your address. And this is a very positive, uh, motivational things which you have stated in your address. Without wasting more time, I would like uh, Sri Mangirish Salilkar, sir, who is uh, the IT chair uh, of SHM Goa Council. Uh, I would like you to highlight. And uh, of course, you are the moderator of this session. So I wish you all the very best and also to our guest speakers. I would like you to take this forward, the panel discussion. Over to you, Mangiri, sir. Muted. Okay. Am I audible? Yeah. No. So, uh, thank you, Darshana. Uh, it's my pleasure to present this first online event uh, focused around technology under the SOCHM Goa Council. And as the chairman of the IT committee SOCHM Goa, it's an honor to moderate this session along with esteemed uh, panelists and audience joining us across India. Uh, before introducing my panelists, I would like to also acknowledge the presence of uh, Mangiri sir who has been a uh, uh, very strong uh, pillar uh, for the industry in Goa and uh, he has been uh, always a motivator to me uh, as when I have been uh, initially joining the industry also he has always been the one who has been patted my back and you know always pushed me behind so I always acknowledge that sir so thank you uh, and uh, we'll be shortly join uh, I mean we'll be uh, Mr. Sagar Sargaonkar, our co-chairman for uh, Asuchem also will be joining us shortly. So, so if, as we start with the introduction of our panelist here, so it's my pleasure to introduce the first panelist of this discussion. Uh, if you have seen the banner, let's go in the order of the banner from left to right. So uh, my very good friend and a result-oriented entrepreneur who inspires me, Vijay Thomas, who is today one of Goa's IT tycoon, grew up in Goa and lived in different parts of the world, including Chennai, Montreal, Boston, and currently settled in Toronto. Vijay Thomas is founder and CEO at Tangentia, a leading digital transformation company with operations in Canada, US, and India. Tenjicha is recognized as a leader in the digital transformation space and counts many prestigious companies globally like customers including Suncor, Jaguar, Land Rover, Reliance Retail, Royal Bank of Canada, Canopy Growth, LCBO, Whirlpool and many others. Tenjicha was one of the profit 500 list of fastest growing companies in Canada six years in a row and Tangentia America was also a part of INC 5000 list of fastest growing companies in the USA. So you know who is there along with us today. So he has a BE engineering, uh, mechanical engineering from Karnatak uh, University and an MBA from Goa Institute of Management. Vijay is 
active in multiple local and global business organizations. He was the 32nd president of the Indo-Canadian Chamber of Commerce. He is also on the board of Thai Toronto. So welcome Vijay Bab. Uh, going ahead, coming up next is another Vijay. He is Dr. Vijay Borges. Vijay sir is a person who has really been an inspiration and given his blood and sweat for Goa's education system. Dr. Borges with over 25 years of experience in the IT industry, academia and research is today the project director Project Management Unit, Directorate of Technical Education, Government of Goa. To incorporate computational and design tech thinking abilities, as well as programming into school level teaching in the state of Goa, in order to prepare for the needs of the digital world of the 21st century, Government of Goa has notified a new scheme called Coding and Robotics Education in School Scheme in Government and government aided high schools. He is the person who is spearheading this CARES program. Previously, he has held position as joint managing director of Infotech Corporation of Goa, was also the officer on special duty OSD to the IT minister of government of Goa, was professor at the Goa College of Engineering, has published books of, on technology and has many peer reviewed journal publications, international conferences publications to his credit. He is a visiting fellow at Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai, and also Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata. Just for your information and additional information of all the audience out here, he has been my professor during my engineering college days. I still remember his dedication and energy in the classroom. Welcome Dr. Vijay Borges, sir. Uh, my next panelist definitely needs no introduction. He is famous for his analysis and commentaries and economics, politics and public policies on news and media. An academic scholar, an alumnus of IIT and the IIMs, a literary author, orator and popular columnist and has established himself as a result-oriented administrator. I would like to welcome Dr. Manoj Kamat, who is the youngest full professor, youngest principal, and the youngest assessor at the NEC peer teams and has assessed around 10 colleges in the country to date. Currently, he is the principal of Dempo College. Professor Kamat is a postdoctoral fellow in economic analysis from Osmania University, Hyderabad a collaboration program with University of Texas at Austin, US, besides having a PhD from IIT Bombay in the area of empirical finance. A university gold medalist at the postgraduate level from Goa University, he has PG in business administration from Central University Pondicherry and has obtained teacher fellowships from IIM Indore and IIM Kozikul. Professor Kamat writes a blog titled Economically Yours on Dainik Gomantak, which I don't miss, and the Navin Times every Saturday. Currently, he is the honorary trustee of Gurukul College, a CBSE school in Ponda, on the governing body of Salgaonkar College of Law and, uh, and Goa University Court. He, is, he was formerly the chairman of Goa Commerce Association, chairman of the Education Committee of GCCI, he, has, he was earlier uh, a coordinator of the Goa Lusophonia Games 2013 and advisor to the Goa Industrial Development Corporation, where he has also been awarded for the transformation in GIDC as the best business enabler of the year 2016 by Business Goa. For his writings, he is cited as the best columnist of the year 2018 by Tony Gomentak. And I think he has a lot of awards and accolades to his uh, uh, career. So I think uh, I would like to cut short all these things and I would like to welcome Manoj sir. It's my pleasure to have you on this panel. Uh, finally, we have uh, the ever smiling and the only lady on this panel, 
Professor Dr. Mridula Goyal. Professor is uh, uh, she's the professor of Department of Economics and Finance, Bits Pilani, KK Billa, Goa Campus, creating the startup ecosystem in the Goa Campus of Bits Pilani. And Institute of Eminence has been an exciting personal journey for her, from giving a formal in, uh, structure to the campus student e cell to building the center of innovation, incubation, and entrepreneurship on campus, from idea to startup by students through a unique new venture creation course across all four campuses of the university. This course runs entirely with support of startup founders, VCs, and each idea is mentored by Silicon Valley alumni of the Institute. She has set up an ICT incubator in 2013 and a bio incubator in 2018 with the government grants set up at Bits Pilani Goa Innovation uh, Incubation and Entrepreneurship Society in 2020 to sustain and grow the incubation ecosystem. Currently, she is a member of the Goa State Innovation Council, Institute Innovation Council of Goa University, governing body of Don Bosco College of Engineering, Board of Studies of Chogli College, Entrepreneurship Committee of DSC funded BITS Biosit Foundation. So let's welcome Dr. Mridila Goel. Thank you so much. So, so let's get on the discussion straight. I would like to keep it very simple, uh, panelists. Uh, I have a few questions which I would like to ask direct to the panelists. However, if any other panelist wishes to add, please feel free uh, to speak anytime. Uh, the audience will definitely get an opportunity to ask their questions towards the end of the session in the Q&A option on the right hand bottom corner of the screen. Depending on our time, we will accept a few questions. So. Can we start? Yes. Okay. Good. So we have seen India uh, now becoming the fifth largest economy, which was 10 years ago, almost the 10th largest economy. Uh, India is completing its over uh, 100 years in 2047. Uh, and Modi's mission, our Honorable Prime Minister Dr. Uh, Narendra Modi ji's mission on making India's the third largest economy by then. So he has definitely some goals. He definitely has is, a, is, is on mission. And we've seen that from his latest union budget where it was totally revolving around technology. We have seen that it has been a budget which is industry friendly and has definitely favored on ease of doing business. So let us see on the academia side how things are shaping and how is technology favoring them and how we can be really look at technology being implemented and how it can be taken ahead in the academia side. So uh, my first question is to uh, Dr. Manoj, sir. What are the challenges that educators face when incorporating technology into their teaching or accepting changes to curriculum based on new technologies. Uh, well, we have and seen an add on, and, 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 and an add on to that is what do you think is the expected outcome? If we relate all these things to the new education policy also. Uh, well, we have seen uh, from the COVID times. Uh, that technology has uh, increasingly reopening the education system ecosystem has increasingly relied on the technology to sustain. So earlier technology was an enabler. Now technology during uh, COVID times has been the only reason why education system still survives. Today. Now let us agree uh, with that uh, particular fact. But heavens, having said that, you know uh, the digital education and online education has a lot of things to do. Uh, and then we need to adopt technology to a greater extent in the future. Now, I see some uh, specific challenges in the education ecosystem uh, with regards to technology. First, it is with regards to having computing devices or digital devices that are affordable, affordable to the masses, affordable to the common people. Because during COVID times, we also realized there was something called as a digital divide. 
uh, a divide between those who had it and those who did not have it. So having affordable computing devices, reducing uh, the uh, tax component on this, making it affordable, allowing huger imports, uh, larger imports of technology, or uh, indigenization of technology is something which is required in order to bring in more technological uh, assistance uh, in the educational ecosystem. Second is those institutions which already could afford uh, or already have existing digital platforms and ICT, we have to see how they would in the future optimize uh, on the technology and expand the existing platforms. Now for this, uh, what we will need to do is provide assistive tools to them. Here we rely on the industry because here uh, for education ecosystem to catch up, probably support is required from a technology oriented industry in order to orient us with regards to what are the assistive tools uh, which are uh, required for monitoring the progress of diverse group of learners, the heterogeneous uh, group of learners spread across. Finally, I also think there is a need for us to invest on uh, a creation of open, uh, uninterruptible uh, and evolvable uh, public digital infrastructure. We cannot be relying more on license softwares, uh, which has typical uh, limited utility and which has become absolutely unaffordable uh, for education institutions to cope up. So uh, we require more open source softwares uh, and more investments in uh, the, that regard from the government or more assistance in that regard so that we create uh, what is a shareable, collaborative, public digital infrastructure. Finally, and most importantly, if you want educational content to reach across borders of the state, uh, which would transcend the entire country, we require educational programs that are available in different languages uh, and, 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 and vernacular languages and which are available 24 by 7. For this, probably we will have to create uh, what I say, more virtual labs or more digital platforms or create and support system where we have a blended approach for experiential learning. So I think these are typically challenges what the educational ecosystem sees. Now, with regards to NEP, uh, I have something to add. Uh, now, uh, we have seen that NEP talked about what is a uh, not only digitization of education, but it also talked about uh, equity in education. It talked about uh, what is a uh, spreading education and increasing the gross enrollment ratio. Herein, I would like to draw your attention to the FIKI's report, which came in 2040. Uh, which talked about uh, how our educational ecosystem in India needs to be research and development oriented or more technology oriented in order to achieve the objectives of NEP. And what were the objectives? Uh, 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 increasing the access, increasing the equity, increasing the quality of education, affordability of education and accountability of education. Now we need to see whether the technological development goals or technological transformation goals of the nation are tuned to the education or aligned to the educational policy or not. Because if you need to create a vibrant, knowledgeable society, or uh, if you want to take up, as you said, uh, take up India as a global knowledge superpower, we require more infusion of technology in the educational system. Now, what we will need to do here, first is to build up, there is a need for us in order to achieve the objectives of NEP, to build up intellectual and institutional capacities in educational technology. We have seen ed techs have affected us in good way as well as in the bad way. But then how we have a collaborative approach with educational technology companies or associations like that of maybe Asochem, uh, your technology uh, wing, or, or, or Goa Institute of Technology, uh, what do you say, your GITP or whatever it is, uh, to build up institutional capacities, uh, to, to have more kind of a collaborative learning. Second, uh, there has to be a strategic thrust of, techno of technological domain in education, whether it, be this, uh, it is in reference to engineering education or uh, your uh, degree programs like, uh, programs like that of your BCA or B or bachelor's in vocational studies, etc. We need to articulate new directions for uh, research, new directions for new learning, new directions for uh, innovation. And here we have seen there were a lot of initiatives which NAP has also taken on its own, which the government has taken the honors. First one is in creation of e-content, creation of digital repositories for uh, larger dissemination, etc. Now. If you really need to enhance the utility of all this, what the government is doing, probably we will have to address on leveraging the technology for which we require the industry to help us because 
the problem with uh, major ecosystem educational ecosystems like us or degree colleges like us is that we are cut off uh, with regards to access of information uh, with regards to what are the new technologies and how we can uh, actually implement those technologies in 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 our day to day endeavors I, I would hear I would hear like to uh, ask Mridula ma'am, uh, Dr. Mridula, uh, I would like to know from your side, uh, considering the same challenges, uh, what is your what is your view on this? Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, Dr. Manoj has given a you know very comprehensive uh, perspective on uh, digitization and the infrastructural perspectives, etc. So, I won't go into that and I'll just uh, go into certain <coughs> challenges on the other side. And that is to adopt technology. Uh, the role of people becomes absolutely critical. Uh, the government uh, can address 1st of all, providing the infrastructure and our recommendations can reach uh, rightly as he has already put. Uh, on my side, I would like to say that, uh, you know, educationists and in academia. Uh, so there is an average age, which will not be uh, necessarily very, very young because as teachers become more experienced, they are supposed to bring a lot more uh, wisdom and perspectives, which is away from the textbook and the basic knowledge. Uh, I find that one of the key challenges that will be faced and uh, having, uh, you know, as you mentioned earlier, I've uh, been with colleges like Don Bosco and Chogale at a closer level. Uh, I find that uh, for teachers to adapt uh, to the requirement of digitization is uh, either it will be like a compulsion, like in COVID, everyone was just forced to do it and there was no option. But that was the basic just delivery, but some of us were more conversant with it than others. The way to go around it would be that either it is like a compulsion, no option kind of a scenario. Or uh, you also need to enable the teachers by uh, training them, A, making them comfortable with the new technologies, or providing assistance to certain group of teachers who may have it, may find it difficult. Uh, I, I, I had been teaching for 15 years already in 97 when I learned to use the internet. And after that, uh, and that was good because by the time I come to bits uh, completely, a uh, tech enabled university 10 years have passed and uh, I'm comfortable with it. I think if I would have come to bit straight away uh, from teaching in Delhi University without my B school where I had to do some tech uh, application, but uh, I would have not been able to do my job here because the basic amount of tech that was required even in 2008 was quite a lot. So, uh, as we are, you know, seeing the technology is in a fast pace. Uh, we need to look at the, uh, you know, the people behind it as well. In this context, uh, I think the talk on this topic is, uh, you know, going to be lacking completely if we don't use the term chat GPT. So, uh, let's talk about chat GPT later. Let's talk about chat GPT uh, later. But I would like to ask. I want to come back to it because I just want to connect it with the, what I'm saying. And that is that it's going to make, it is making the life and it is expected to make the life of teachers uh challenging difficult. And much more difficult because yeah. uh i mean and students are smart some are really smart when you yeah. use chat gpt uh, everything is coming on you know what is the teacher going to provide you and yesterday we had an expert from delhi university uh from the faculty of management studies in campus and he was sharing that it really means that instead of teaching what is in the books what is easily available on the net you need to uh, create a thinking process. So uh, when we are talking about technology, uh, it should not only be like an enabler and everyone is going tech crazy, which is what is happening. And uh, so when you use it, uh, the students are already at a level. So where does the teacher, where le which level do we come in? So that is where the way that you teach has to focus more on inculcating you know, thinking, critical thinking, appreciation of that. And that's where I think the challenge is because many teachers uh, have to move out from the regular way of teaching into a level where you guide, inspire the students rather than just give out the learning. So uh, I'll stop here uh, for now. If you want something on the NEP, I'll come back to it later and let 
Yes, uh, yes, hundred percent, hundred percent, ma'am. But I, I want you to answer another question honestly. Do you really think academia gets enough support from the industry? And what are the challenges that really prevent academia and industry from working together more effectively? Maybe yes. elaborate on some yes. uh, some examples of actually uh, successful collaborations between academia and industry, so that you know we get more insight about how sure. really we can. Uh, you know, yeah. Sure. Uh, so uh, I work at Bits Pilani and uh, we have a very, very uh, important program called the Practice School Program. We have a work integrated learning program and both these programs are directly connected with industry. Uh, and of course, placements is always connected with industry. So for all these various functions, the uh, visitation of industry to the institution uh, is very, very uh, important and very close. Now, however, uh, what does industry want? What would, uh, I mean, we have uh, founders here right from you, Mangirish, uh, to Vijay uh, and uh, Mr. Riker himself. So, and of course, Dr. Salgaukar is here. So, uh, what do you want? You would like to, uh, if you are going to help an institution, an academic institution, you would like to get the benefit of it because you are doing business and uh, I completely understand that and I think that's perfect. So when you want that, you want to help students who will ultimately be manpower for you to be skilled in things which you need, right? So uh, the perspective here is that when these uh, academia, I mean, these industry people come to BITS, that is what they also say. They are willing to set up centers of excellence they are willing not only to guide us on making curriculum, they are willing to handhold in delivery of the curriculum as well. What do they want? They want commitment from the institution. They want commitment from the, you know, some from the students. So they want the institution to kind of get the students to be committed to the industry, which is providing all this support. And therefore, uh, that is now where is the challenge? Okay. Uh, so, how would that operate? The industry would come and speak to some division, some director, and it would kind of go through different heads of department and then ultimately to the faculty. One key challenge which is happening is that uh, some years, and many of us are educationists, so we understand that some years down the line, you know, uh, what has happened is that there has been a lot of stress on faculty performance. As when I started 40 years back as a teacher, you were just supposed to be a good teacher. That was all. And there was no concept. You were, if you were a good teacher means you taught the subject, you made kids understand you were on time. You took your classes. That was great. And I'm, and I started with Miranda house in Delhi university, which uh, in all this ranking business is uh, been ranked number 1 for the last 4 years. Now, however, when you go to the private setting, and I don't know, I'm not very well versed with the government institutions. Faculty has a lot of performance appraisal onto them and they are expected to perform on research because most institutions are now getting ranked as to the research that they are research outputs that they are creating and moving on to innovations, patents, and finally, even startups are now important to be created. So when uh, the industry people come and some faculty should own that relationship with one particular industry in one domain, which is the expertise of the faculty. Do they want to give that kind of time uh, to inculcating the relationship where the learning will go to the students and then to the industry? What they ask is that give us some research funding. Uh, we will do research, which will benefit us also. And then uh, the whole program will run. Here comes a problem that the attitude of the academia and the way of working and the way of working of the industry is not exactly the same. Uh, industry has to run on timelines and deliverables. Academia and academic research tends to uh, not be that much time bound. And uh, the deliverables therefore become very difficult for the faculty to commit to. And therefore the sustainability of that model where industry will give some fund and the research would be done. And then these students would also learn through that kind of a new technology, which is being developed. All that loop doesn't get uh, completed. So, uh, industry, uh, at bits, I mean, what we find is that industry actually wants to come and help, but the way that they want to help 
is often uh, not so easy to accept by the academic institution. And of course, there are the challenges that you cannot keep changing the curriculum uh, so fast. Being a private university, we still have easier systems whereby you can take it to the Senate, introduce a new course, uh, which is required because of tech change and so on. But even that takes quite some time and commitment from some body. And that body has to be faculty members. So uh, unless, you know, uh, old school teachers who kind of uh, built institutions and teachers who uh, now have to first build themselves also, along with contributing to institutional development, I find uh, this is a very much change in mindset. And uh, therefore, for industry to support, uh, it becomes difficult. However, there are examples of success. Uh, for example, uh, in case of BITS, you know, we introduce a program uh, called Financial Risk and Analytics uh, Management. Uh, it's called popularly FRAM. And the course was entirely introduced in collaboration with Credit Suisse. And uh, they had people coming in, the faculty here joined, and it was led actually by a person who was in charge, who was a finance person and who was in charge of placements and training. So it became perfect uh, to the extent that he now just runs that from Chennai as a full-time thing. Uh, said, saying all that, you know, the kind of commitment that industry appreciates is sometimes not sustainable by the faculty. I think there is a gap in mindset. And again, this is like very much related to my first response. When you're looking at technology, uh, keep it, uh, you know, we need to look at the people uh, perspective. Uh, that's what I feel about it. Going ahead, uh, before to Vijay Bajes, sir, uh, Vijay, uh, you had two Vijays. So, Vijay Thomas, you have something to uh, add. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to add to what um, uh, Dr. Mizula Ji was mentioning. Um, you know, in, in the old days, when I was in, in, in studying in school, we had this, uh, the, the lady, Dr. Shakuntala Devi, that could count numbers pi to an extent which to, in today's world is irrelevant. I mean, why do you need to know all those things? You have a, a calculator. So in the same way, I think as society, we will we will take uh, chat GPT and some of these large language models as 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 uh, poker stakes. We will accept that that is there. So it is it is we will evolve and and some might evolve a little later than others, but it's eventually we will have to face reality that we don't need to you know use our brains to do all some of these things i mean but for innovation and other things we will have to do this and then this is we've seen this happen in the in my lifetime i've seen this happen where you know we were told you need to know the tables up to so much irrelevant i mean it doesn't matter so much i mean and in fact my son is 12 years old and he goes to a a, a school in canada one thing that I thought was very different from the Indian education system, he's been taught estimation. So he's taught how to estimate. You don't need precision. In today's world, you know, direction is more important than precision. For precision, you have the calculator. So, so you know, so I think that there are elements like that that I think we, we have to embrace and, and, and get to um, get into our, uh, you know, students in the education system. And, and so they can, they can take and take decisions quickly. And those are, those are, I think, things that uh, might get relevant. Thank you. Fantastic, Vijay. Uh, great, great inputs here. Uh, Bajji, sir, uh, I would like to add a question to you. Do you really think <laughs> academia gets the support from the industry? Sorry for my voice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi. Okay. So I, I will bring a different perspective. Okay. Now I think so. Like you know, both the both the uh, the first two speakers who spoke, I think so. They're coming from the higher education space. Okay. And that's about about ten percent of like you know from where we are talking about the school education. That the space I'm coming from. Okay. And that's the problem which is there. Okay. And that's a very large problem. Okay. So I'm talking about, okay, I'll go back into like, you know, the foundational and numerical and literacy skill sets. Okay. Where there are lots of reports, which basically talked about like, you know, if you do not address, okay, the, the foundational and numerical skill sets, then we are creating a, a, a population of people like you know who may not be adaptable to the rapid changes 
okay which are there okay going back to your first question technology is fantastic whatever is there there is lots of data we got digital libraries online platforms we got like you know the, the open educational resources there is so much of data which is available the question okay and i think so everybody is addressing okay is about how do i take this data so that's very important Hello. Yeah. yeah. Am I? Am I? You can continue. Yeah, you can continue. Yes. Yeah. So, but the important thing for us is like you know to talk about how do we take this data which is there, make the person know what the data to be adopted, and how does he use technology to use this data and use for his productivity. So, those are the key. challenges which are there you know and uh, if you do not address it at the initial stages okay to 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 the audience or to the students in the initial stages it becomes a little bit of difficulty like you know to for him to take this particular challenges when he's maybe uh, in his higher education when he moves into higher education and that's where we have to bridge this particular gap uh my previous uh, speaker talked about uh, the equality and the equity which nep talks about and i think so what the nep is stressing about is about the equity to uh, for everybody you know the critical thinking the experiential learning which is coming at earlier stages learning by doing very important you know and the role of the teacher which is completely changing especially in the school education it is no longer as we call it like the sage on the stage it is basically the the guide to be on the side okay so this is very very important so the role of the teacher in technology to use and basically guide the student in the school level to develop basic scientific uh, knowledge to basically develop the scientific temper to use the fundamental analytical things which vijay uh, was talking about and it's a very beautiful thing that in canada they uh, they are doing about uh, doing those things and i think so like you know, this is what the government of goa is also doing to the project which we are heading under the ks project i think so uh, nep and this entire technology we are getting somewhere together the marriage has to happen okay it's 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 a learning thing okay and it will happen i think so that's that's quite hopeful thing for us okay so so uh, uh vijay thomas uh, my next question to you okay uh, post covid uh, we have seen that the tech industry uh, was really you know facing ups and downs we have seen great resignations then of lately we have we are also looking at tech layoffs really not sure what's in for us next but we see one thing is that you know people are or have started accepting automation and digitalization in their businesses so but there are people who are still not understand uh, who have not understood the need for it uh there are businesses or non tech industries who have started accepting automation and what what do you think is the current trend happening in around around this side where technology is now as a technology it is going into the industry thanks magrish so there's two parts here one is the tech industry itself where you and i and we're all you know uh, players in in that um, so I, i'll 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 first start with a uh, um, you know uh, a, a comment or a, a saying that um, john f kennedy said and maybe he stole from a chinese proverb we said may you live in interesting times right i mean so so basically it is it is interesting times and very interesting times right now so so this can work two ways one is it's a double edged sword so anybody that embraces this interesting times will do very well anybody that doesn't is going to you know get uh, you know stay be put by, by the wayside so 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 i think in, what happened with with uh, with uh, the, with the covid it 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 basically i think um, um dr kamat was talking about the divide so there was a divide in the tech industry as well some people embraced it right away uh, people embraced work from home uh, people who could not do that but somehow finally forced to do it but if they didn't take to it naturally they 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 were out of the environment they were out of water so they they couldn't really do well so i think agility is a very important thing 
And, and um, I think from a pace of change today, and I think um, some of the other speakers also talked about this, uh, Dr. Midula talked about, you know, the time it takes to change curriculum and stuff like that. The, the problem with that we face in today's world is chat GPT in, in six months had 100 million downloads. Chat GPT has become a verb in, in, in six months, right? Even faster than Google, faster than everything else. So, so, you know, so, and, 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 and believe it or not, like people have a Google screen open. Most of the young people today have a chat GPT screen open. Now we have not embraced it. Not every, I don't have one as yet. I, it's on my list of things to do, but people as in the course of how they, they, they live and work and everything it's there. Now, now, how does some of this come in? I, I think so. So that's one part of the, so the tech industry, I think is we're we're a little quicker uh, adopters, uh, you know, we will survive and, and I think it will happen. But I think the, the one is the layoffs, all of that. There's, there's two, three things happening there. One is not just automation, not just that. There was also a lot of extra money, you know, uh, believe it or not, I think the problem was uh, not underfunding, was overfunding. There was too much money that went into the startup thing. So nobody had any, any, any governance on how you spend the money or whatever. So, uh, and, and then finally somebody said, okay, what are you guys doing? And when somebody started asking hard questions, uh, and, you know, and, and by the time they have to answer those hard questions, they stopped the money and that's what happened. Okay. So I, I truly believe that's what happened for some of these layoffs. Uh, it will come back when, you know, they will have to go back to their drawing board and say, uh, you know what, we only need 10 million. We don't need hundred million before they were like, if you want hundred million, ask for 200 and then guess what? They will give you 200. So I think that's what happened there. So let's let's we can put that aside. Um, now on 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 industry and regular companies embracing uh, technology. I think this um, you know from a, a mindset and especially in India, um, I think uh, it's a more a cultural thing. Most companies till today, and and I joke about this when we sell software to companies, people did not add as much value to software. They say, what is software, right? It is not hard. There is nothing. There is no peace there. So there were times when I thought, let's put this in a big box, right? And, you know, make it look good. And then we sell it to them for a couple of lakhs of rupees. And guess what? They will pay. But if you give them something that comes on a CD or downloads from the internet, there was no value. But I think slowly people are seeing the value of it. I think it is, it is a, you know, people are seeing how this can, this can help. There are a couple of roadblocks in that one is, you know, transparency. Uh, if you really want to get value of this, I mean, I'll give you an example of a Kirana shop, right? If you're a Kirana shop, um, you, you can use, uh, you know, a, a very cost effective, um, you know, uh, software for inventory for POS. Uh, and what it can actually do is forecast. What should you order? Right, it, it doesn't have to be that one guy that's been sitting behind the counter that knows what to order. And, and if he orders wrong, and, and, and I started one of my earliest businesses was, uh, uh, was uh, I started a distribution company for Nestle and Unilever in, in, in Goa. Uh, so, so I know if you buy 10 tins of lactogen, it's a lot of money that's stuck, okay? And if you don't sell that, okay? So, so how do you make sure? So there is, by, by doing an efficient, you know, ordering system and, and in ensuring that you have the right inventory, it helps. But to do that, you have to put everything that you have first transparently in, into one system, right? And and so I think at some point people think by by cutting corners or, or doing something you can gain. But I think at some point uh, when when you actually see that if, if everything is, is transparent and you also build systems that take the human out. Okay, you really don't need to be using your brains to do that. I mean, the system can do it better now. Now, so I think these are, and then if you spend your time talking to customers, building the rapport, and I'm just giving a Kirana store example, it, it gains. But I think slowly people will will get it now. I, I like I. I liked your I liked your Kirana uh, example, uh, Vijay, because uh, that's the same thing uh, with your example. Walmart is doing uh, using the same transparency in data, and now they are doing using data science to actually see yes. effectiveness in business to make sure you know uh, in 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 which particular biscuit or cookies is sold in the maximum you know which which season and so on. You know, yeah. So okay. Uh, if you are done with that answer, I have another uh, additional yeah, additional question to that. Uh, so now 
you know you know uh, as a as a founder of goa technology association you know uh, and and you have been a uh, one of the founder members uh, of gta and we have seen a lot of uh, challenges initially to firstly get all the ecosystem players together and so on and one thing which we saw the biggest gap was the gap in bridging between academia and the government and i think industry has to play a very important role there okay uh, i would like the same question uh, uh, going to uh, monoj kamath sir also later but i want vijay uh, as a one person from the industry and then from the academia answering this that you know one side of preparing industry ready talent pool and the other side showing the vision of growth to the government how can the industry play an important role here thank you mangesh and i am the only non doctor as well okay so <laughs> so uh, the so i think i think one is um, uh, so so academia i think the people on the academic side uh, one thing that has, is is going for academia right now is 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 the internet and and everything is happening outside okay there is a lot of education that's happening outside of the walls of academia okay so 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 i think what is is very important is is at least just directionally kind of directing people i i you know uh, you know i think the fundamentals are very important i, I from academy I'm, i'm a mechanical engineer and 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 i think if you get your fundamentals correct and and that has to come from from education that cannot come from you know the internet right otherwise we'll all become internet doctors there is a lot of us who Uh, Dr. Sagar Sarkangar will go out of business if, if if we all start you know prescribing medicine. But we need to know you know some fundamentals right. We have to get our basics right and 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 you know uh, theory right. And and then I think the 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 application of that theory to business to how uh, you know uh, uh, you know I, I was at an event uh, just yesterday, and and. Uh, some of it can be structured and some can be very unstructured right and what what people said is if you go to dempo college you know i would say and i don't know the exact statistics but more than 50% of the people in dempo college have never stepped into an office right they don't know how an office works so we we don't need to do anything very big at least send them go spend some time okay now i think some of the other people have started doing this uh, industry you know and then at at some level it is as basic as go see how people work right what do they do right so so they you at least they 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 get an idea and some of the times it only needs to show them direction they will go figure it out you know i think we are we are uh, we are we are we are we are a very resilient uh, you know uh, country we're also very you know uh, very um, uh, what's the word i'm looking for very competitive country so you know you go show them you know what there's 100 people in your class there's only five jobs in this place guess what they will figure out the way to do this so this is my view point i think you know um, uh, we've got but we got to at least nudge them figure uh, show them towards that um and 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 the other question i think um, mangirish was about the government i think some of this thing for the from a government standpoint i think uh, the the government more than anything else i think um, you know I, i like to say the government should be cheerleader uh, government should help uh, you know everybody you know you know there's some big uh, things that they should do and then many of them is almost taking themselves out of some of these things i mean the government should take take uh, you know any kind of you know uh, <laughs> Uh, you know less government is good for 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 at least for business uh, academia as well maybe you know i don't know if it, it stifles you or you need a thing but i think freedom and and then some of that stuff might be better so these are my my two cents madam sir yeah uh, to answer this question uh, of the trifa of uh, educational institutions the government systems and the tech industry i feel uh, Though, though these are diverse industries or they are diverse systems, they are interconnected and they are the part of an inter interdependent network. See, obviously, government cannot be a direct player. Government can only be a facilitator. But the educational institutions and tech industry can are our direct players, and they need to come together. And we have understood the need that we have seen the benefits of they coming together. 
in order to spur collaboration and innovation, whether it is respect to products or services, but then everything needs to be put together in a sustainable manner. See, during and after the COVID times, you have seen what, that there has been a remarkable transformation in the education system. And all this transformation has been led and fueled by technological advancements. Meaning, I, al I always attribute the kind of developments that has happened in last uh, couple of years during COVID times and after COVID times to the educator, to the technological sector, to the technological industry, because they provided us the right products at the right time. They told us how to use products. Most of us were not even, uh, what to say, uh, adaptable mentally to those products, but then finally we had to take it. Many e-platforms we have seen have emerged. Interactive tools have come. Immersive creations have happened. And animations, etc., has fostered creativity in young minds. That they have also generated enough interest. But then I believe that in this particular ecosystem to be a thriving ecosystem, there has to be a constant engagement with educational institutions, with government being the mediator and the technological industry. Now, why do I see so? Because I see there are four different levels to technological upgradation in educational institutions. And even now, after so many years, we have been only talking about the first stage. Now, what are the four stages which I see? The first stage was about digital literacy or, or uh, uh, it could be digital literacy in, in schools, uh, at the elementary level and for higher education level, it could be use of technology for experiential learning. That's the first stage. From that stage, uh, that was before COVID, during COVID, we entered into uh, a, a particular setup where we wanted products that could help us to do problem solving uh, or, or uh, making my learners to be creative. Now that COVID period is over. Now we are into a complete transformative stage where we are talking about $5 billion economy, uh, et cetera. So here we require technological products to make our students think critical. Of course, uh, like chat, whether, whether chat GPT uh, and AI helps us to be critical or it, it gives us ready-made, tailor-made, uh, cook products and cook solutions before us, that's a debatable issue. But finally, from this particular point, we need to escalate to a level where we use technologically technology in education systems, educational systems, in order to be globally competitive. What does this mean? Uh, this means basically uh, the kind of connections which we require, which universities or colleges require with the industry, uh, in order to support talent, in order to foster research, etc. Now, a couple of things are uh, well happening, and here in Goa, at least I've seen, uh, including the uh, Goa Technology Association, etc., has been very, very proactive. In number of colleges, I have seen now the uh, technology uh, uh, industry and the institutions have set up collaborative cells, have, have uh, set up platforms where they could do collaborations. I have seen in last one or two years in Goa as such, that technology industry and technology association has entered into MOUs not only in terms for promoting of industrial research uh, to facilitate students' projects, assignments, uh, to facilitate experts from the industry getting into forming of the curriculum, getting into teaching of the subjects, getting into uh, the colleges to adopt new technology, etc. We have also seen Goa Technology Association, technology industry, etc., helping students to gain practical or to say insights to the industry and uh, many of them coming and joining us as visiting faculties, associate faculties, etc. Now we need to go into the next level. First, where, whether the technology industry is ready to come up with some design-made or tailor-made products that could specifically suit the requirements of uh, different educational institutions. For example, my college, may have my requirements uh, for an ERP system may be different as compared to college X or college Y. Here, rather than me uh, telling the industry of what I need, whether the industry would understand uh, and, and uh, tune products to my requirements, and of course make, uh, what do you say, uh, mutually beneficial uh, profitability, uh, derive profitability out of it is in question. Next, what I need at next level to go at next level is professional consultancy. Professional consultancy by the industry to academia. So these things I think uh, are, are, are well required. So finally, as, as to conclude, you know, uh, and continue what I, I started off with, for implementation of technological what is say, solutions in, in, in uh, educational institutions like the Ravas, 
or or uh, uh, anything at the mass level in order to promote equity we require affordable systems we require reliable systems we require high end systems which are easily implementable so what we need to do oh, all right so we are at at college level or higher education level we have achieved a particular level of satisfaction with reference to uh, tuning ourselves with the industry but schools the situation is still alarming we require to modernize the digital infrastructure in in education in, in at the school level this is where your government our government and the industry need to come forward second we need to suggest them what technology would be appropriate and at what levels and how this educational tech companies could uh, come up with products which are required by them third uh, looking at the heterogeneity of the students at the school level or the elementary education level we will need to create uh, what is say tech based learning systems for the students so here i see uh, in as, as the time passes and we are uh, uh, facing further complexities of a transformative world uh, we as governments we as educational institutions and we as technology associations or the technological industry we need to collaborate a little more closely than what we are actually doing now 100%, 100% sir 100% i agree with uh, every statement made by you however uh, just to tell you what hap- what is really happening on school level in goa i would like to ask a question to dr borges here uh, vijay sir dr vijay borges sir you are working on some unique offering to the school students which is one of the initiative taken by the government of goa and what i understand this is not happening anywhere in india so i would like you to share something about this cares project and what made you get associated so deeply in this mission okay so thank you thank you mangesh okay so i get my i get my stage i think so now okay so so let me just put this whole thing in perspective okay everybody here has agreed that the world is going to a transformative disruptive kind of a change knowledge is essential the employment landscape is changing the global economy is like you know going through a different kind of a turmoil every government and everybody sets different kinds of targets and the targets always higher the question comes okay and the critical question comes is how do i make my child okay right now to be one decade later to be knowing how to be adaptive to a system which is going to be coming which we do not know right now okay the question is the child has to be not only not know okay uh, only to learn but the child has to adapt how do i learn okay in this whole new world which we ourselves do not know how to define okay so the question comes is like you know that the sound fundamental educations is an essential quality and a, and something we have to look down okay so i think so now you know what has happened the industry and the academia and when i say the academia let me just be very specific and maybe i'm biased in this particular st- statement which i make is the academia when they talk to the industry or the industry talks to the academia it's always the higher level of, of academia which talks about okay the 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 focus now has to be like you know where is the problem you know if you look at you know what uh, professor ck pralak talks about there is fortune at the bottom of the pyramid okay we are in that 5% you know industry is focusing and maybe in the academia the higher education institutes are focusing there and it is not only that there is also like you know there is the quota system as you call it you know if i am maybe from the elite institutes like you know i talk to maybe the mncs whoever are they talk only to the elite institutes okay what about the tier 2 tier 3 you know that's that's where like the whole question comes and nobody wants to address this particular question i think so but we have to bring those particular things up okay how many people talk to like a dempo college like uh, infosys talking to dempo college or maybe any other college i'm just taking dempo college here. or maybe like how much funding is coming there okay compared to the other institutes okay so that's the question about the tier 2 and tier 3 now coming to what has to be addressed and i think so this is very critical what the nep is addressed nep has gone down very very specifically and said that in middle level schools okay grade 6 7 and 8 critical thinking you know the words are coming very very strong there critical thinking problem solving creative thinking because that's the age you know when you're talking about that's the age where a mind of a child if you attract it there then you have got something who is going to be great you know i use this particular statement too little too late mm. 
Why do I say this? If I talk about an industry talking to an uh, engineering institute or any institute of higher education, you're talking about a gap of around about three years or four years. Okay, the age group of a student who is around about 18 to 21. Okay, and you are trying to expect him to be like, you know, productive to you. And then you say you do not have a, a, a person like, you know, who can be taken on because he doesn't have those particular skill sets. And then you, then there is a statement which comes says like 90% of whoever my engineers are coming are not employable. That's the statement I want to make here is too little, too late. Okay? So let's bring down this whole statement to saying 10 years prior. So. The age group of nine years to 12 years, that's the criticality. And that's where the government of Goa came in the year 19, uh, 2021, saying that we require to address that. NEP came one year before and Goa government said, come on, let's go and let's address this particular prob uh, this problem. And director of technical education was given this mission. Okay, the mission is you lead, let's bring the director of education, let's bring the SERT together. This particular trio forms this, uh, forms this addresses this, this particular problem. Why? Because if the industry is saying we do, not have, we, do, we do not have good people coming in, there is a tech crunch, then let's go back 10 years, let's address this particular problem, let's keep our heads stuck to the ground for the next five years and then come and question, okay, what is my talent coming out from Goa? Goa is unique because like, you know, we're talking about 20,000 only, okay, people are going to be coming out. From this 20,000, okay, if the industry, okay, uh, uh, whoever is there, okay, it's a very small kind of a number which the industry would come. And if I talk to many of these industry people, like, you know, they will always cry, you know, the startups always cry, there is always head hunting. Why is this head hunting coming? Because we're talking about small numbers. Why the small numbers? Because you're not trying to increase your base because nobody's talking about the bottom of the pyramid. How do I bring more people coming into higher education? How do I like, you know, change this particular, we all talk about critical thinking and all these things. And that's why for the last two years, we have stuck our heads onto the ground. What we have done, I will talk about five stages. Okay, the government of Goa, the last two years, we've talked about five stages. The first is like, you know, we went and we revamped the curriculum. Now we are talking about S-E-E-A-M, okay, the science, technology, engineering, okay, art and math. Okay, we revamped this curriculum, brought math, brought art, brought science, brought engineering together, brought these particular aspects about like, you know, how does a child learn things? Okay, so that's very important. That's what we did. We changed the curriculum. The next we said is like, you know, who's going to deliver this curriculum? Okay, now you have got like, you know, a large chunk of teachers who are school teachers. Nobody looks at that particular problem because like, you know, teachers have got their own challenges, have got, people have got into the system. We just cannot like, you know, exit and we say like, you know, this problem doesn't exist. We have to attract it like, you know, on its head. Okay, so what happens is like, you know, we have to skill build these particular teachers. How does it happen? Not just like, you know, you bring a program uh, about three, uh, three days, four days program in a year and expect a, a, a teacher to change. It does not happen. Okay, or you have a mentorship, like you take some master trainers, train them, 10 of them, and you say like, okay, okay, now go and uh, teach about this particular curriculum, does not happen. And I will tell you very specifics. The specifics are that in computational, okay, there was one uh, uh, computer course which was run for the past 15 years. There were these uh, teachers who were taken. 83% of those particular teachers were from non-science, non-engineering background. So that means the last maths they learned or the last science they learned was in their 10th standard. Okay, so we are talking about those kind of problems, 83%, you know, that's a huge number. So do you like, just look at the problem, rush it, or put it under the under the bed cover? No, okay, you have to attract it. What has to be done? We ran a program called a Sumanatso Medavo. You know, Sumanatso Medavo, Suman means like, you know, a weekly kind of a program. So what do we do is like, you know, we take a set of teachers, okay, we call them as the buddy teachers, in a peer learning, in, in a hub and a spoke kind of a method, we deliver it every 15 days, like, you know, this particular buddy teachers goes for the five hours on every Thursday. For the last two years, these teachers go and train the other teachers of how to deliver these curriculums, okay, for their students in their schools for the next coming, upcoming two, uh, two weeks. And this has been happening, you know, and we are, we have seen results coming in. Okay, we have seen like when you do this particular program, teachers are adaptive. It is not that teachers don't want to learn. 
it is only like you know we have to build their confidence people you know because god creates something beautiful and then everybody has got that intelligence and has got the capabilities like you know, to change those particular things and that's what we have done okay and that's where we where we can see and what are the results you know bebras is one international competition four of our students you know from goa okay have participated in one one national level awards this is first in the country i don't know like you know, how many know about this in kodeva there is another competition which is there okay this is on robotics and on uh, computational thinking okay goa has won many awards on those particular things and we are closely associated with them so these are some of the good things which have been coming for the past two years so that's the that's the next aspect the third is like you know we have developed a lot of teaching and learning resources we have developed our own learning management tools you know technology is very important if i got to scale it up technology is important so we have developed our own learning management system called as prerna okay this periodic reflection on educational reach okay so that's the that's the kind of a tool which we have developed and we have developed chatbots so why chatbots and all this is like a unique learning if the teacher is not there how do you use technology how do you adopt technology we have created videos we have asked mcqs where the teacher as well as the student whoever has missed or wants to learn new things wants to learn higher level of things that's where it is that's where like you know, he can come into technology the fourth aspect is we have got another track called as elective curriculum if a child who is interested in technology wants to learn technology in more deeper way okay it cannot be given for everybody you know it's like if you want to learn higher maths can you go for something like no different for those particular select few so we ran this particular program called as elective curriculum where we gave fellowship to 50 okay uh, engineers okay who are passed out or who are working in the industry we, uh, we hired them and this 50 engineers who are with their with their uh, undergraduate degrees post graduate some of them are phd programs they go after school hours in each of this hub schools so there is hub school 114 hub schools which we have identified where we have developed a lot of labs in those particular schools and these teachers and the students from the surrounding schools come and this teachers who are fellows who are uh, people like you know with engineering background give them experiential learning on technologies on the little i mean the advance of technologies maybe it is machine learning on artificial intelligence adapted for that particular age group of 6 grade 6 grade 7 grade 8 okay so these are the things like you know which we have developed and the last and this is very important everybody was talking about infrastructure you know in covid times and despite having the two wars which went to whether ukraine or you talk about the taiwan and the entire chip shortage the goa government after a gap of 15 years under this particular scheme we have upgraded all the 435 schools and this is credit to the government of goa okay to the honorable chief minister that he he was there backing us out okay and he really said like this has to be done 435 so we have given 4467 computing equipments in all the schools with very good infrastructure not only that this particular um, uh, uh, equipment which has been supplied has got okay it is a wifi a connected network that means through wifi routers and all these things are given that is another thing there is another scheme from the department of education where we are talking the last mile connectivity the internet okay so now there is going to be a kind of a rental model instead of like using the government internet the uh, institute that means the 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 head of the institute that means any school and all will be able to apply uh, take any kind of a vendor and give the uh, internet to his labs okay this is the kind of initiatives which have happened under the coding and robotics schemes okay over to you mangrish fantastic i would i would say uh, it's it's a great thing which uh, none of us knew all about and we are all talking about uh, you know what's government really doing and you have been silently listening to all these people and then putting up your ace card <laughs> so so good good one uh, vijay sir uh, okay before we go to our, our last question uh, for this uh, panel uh, i would like uh, the audience to put up any questions if you have on the right hand side bottom uh, corner you have a q and a option you can put up your question now there and uh, i'll be happy to take it up to the panelists and uh, yeah so my last question uh i would like you to because we are running out of time just one minute each okay possibly we'll try our best 
we know a lot of technological advances happening and we are sure that you know there will be a lot of challenges also associated with these advances ai is a blessing i feel but for some they call it a curse google cto himself resigned understanding the potential risks involved in this so we have been adapting also to this uh, you know uh, uh, online classes now uh, zoom google meets and so on which we adapted uh, you know as a as a new thing what we had to adapt uh, as, as a uh, thing uh, i would like to tell what do you think will be the future trends in education and in edutech uh, anyone can take it up. Uh, I'd like to uh, speak on two sides of this. Uh, yeah, quickly. please. Uh, so first is uh, that I personally, as a teacher, I think the quality of students and uh, overall just the quality uh, of their commitment, learning, everything has gone seriously down ever since COVID has come and gone also. I mean, kind of gone. Uh, that's one observation. And they don't really seem to be much interested as a large group. And I'm talking obviously from my own experience. Uh, that is one uh, serious disaster that uh, has happened uh, on the edtech side. Now, edtech is like a very big industry. And uh, I'll raise the question of uh, the biggest uh, unicorn, sunicorn, whatever we created called Baiju's, and the layoffs and uh, that have happened. Uh, why? Personally, uh, being quite familiar with the product that was created by Ravindran, uh, the founder of Baju, the co-founder, it was phenomenal, the quality of delivery. When they started scaling, uh, that quality was maintained till a level. As the scale and as the VC funding, everything grew. It's a quality which went down. And ultimately, that is why the bubble crashed. So... When you're doing ed tech, the call, I think it's not about uh, the challenges of tech and you get dissatisfied by it. It is somehow to keep on maintaining the quality in the uh, tech that is very, very important. So, uh, for example, one of my, uh, you know, alumni uh, student founders, he does, uh, he did a startup in which you could evaluate uh, using technology and teachers. I think the worst thing which I find as a function as a teacher, the most boring is to check copies. The same answer hundred times, especially in a social science subject. And now so chat so it will be more. <laughs> yeah, but uh, you don't allow uh, laptops, then it will be still okay. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, so they came up with that, but that is where the quality comes, you know, because you're expecting the software will be able to only mark things which are in a particular pattern and identify that. But if there is a range of response, uh, that will not get class, you know, uh, like which as a teacher you would be able to capture. So I think those are some challenges in ed tech. Lastly, if this is my last bit of sentence, we, the topic of this uh, panel is injecting technology in the ecosystem. We have interpreted this completely as injecting information technology in the ecosystem. And as uh, having set up a bio incubator, I just want to apprise that there is this bio incubator in Goa and biotechnology is like a very, very important thing more so after COVID. So uh, we must look at the challenges and there I'll just connect it with the requirement from industry. I think industry, other than just giving funding and that is always limited from industry side uh, in this space, is the government which does large amount of funding in this particular space. But what industry can do is uh, industry can give opportunity to the innovations which are coming out in such uh, sectors to do product testing, product trials, and provide that. When we set up the bio in, uh, incubator in uh, Bits, which is very close to Varna, which is one of the biggest pharma belts in our country, uh, it was that we would get some kind of synergy uh, happening between the, you know, the industry would come and give us something and it would all work out, which did not happen. So uh, maybe the kind of quality, so you cannot have quality immediately in a biotech, right? But somebody needs to support it to take it forward. And I would just like to, uh, you know, claim onto that. Thank you okay. so much. Uh, thank you. Manoj, Manoj sir. Uh, well, uh, let me start with uh, what, what what is the current problem? Quickly, with, quickly. Uh, we are running out of time, so we need to make it very crisp. Yes. What is the current problem with uh, the... Uh, 
uh, technology industry today. First is that technology industry in, in the drive for being scalable is, is not uh, currently, what is a uh, contesting on its core competencies. That's the reason we have seen al almost more than 80% of startups are, startups are failing because in the drive to become scalable, they forget what is their core business and then how do you drive it? Second, the valuations of all these industries is a core issue which, which uh, we need to get in a little more seriously. Having said that, I understand that there are five to seven uh, different uh, new insights to technology which the educational sector must look forward. First one is the AR, augmented, rela uh, augmented rela uh, reality. And the second one is the adaptive learning technologies. Along with this, there is a more scope for uh, educational, what is it, technology uh, companies to get into learning analytics because that is one side uh, which we have uh, completely compromised and overlooked. Because all this time we have, we have been only looking into delivery of educational content, but not looking at the models of assessment, models of how students are learning and how do we digitize that. Very important uh, area is since with, uh, with, with, with 5G coming and then competency based learning systems needs to be developed. So uh, along with chat GPT, AR, adaptive learning, I believe that there is a lot of scope for new technologies in, in, in the realms of uh, learning analytics and uh, using uh, 5G to the fullest. Great, great. Vijay sir, Vijay, uh, Dr. Vijay Bajaj sir. You know, one of the one small crisp comment I would give, you know, you know, what is lacking is not the technology. Technology is already developed. Industry has done its beautiful job. Okay. The thing is like, you know, if academia or the space which is lacking is like, you know, can I have good mentors? Can I have good teachers? Can I have those particular guides by my sides? You know, that's what is lacking, you know, the human resource. Okay. Uh, you know, somehow we cannot replace that. I believe, you know, maybe I'm biased, but I think so. That's, that's something like, you know, which, which we have to like, you know, strive to develop. Oh, you're you are not biased. You are, you are not biased. You are a person who has been in the industry. Then here you have been into academia and now you are a government. <laughs> so you know all the three parts to it very well. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Vijay, sir, the last comments from your side. So I, I think uh, what I, I, the way I look at this is, the, you know, academia, um, as uh, Dr. Borges is, is doing, you know, there's two, two tracks. One is a, a general awareness track of technology, you know, which, which I think you're starting off giving people the tools. And, I, and I'm giving an example. If, if you're using chatbots in school and, and these people now go to industry, they already know chatbots. They don't need to be doing now. Now I give, I'll go back to my Kirana store. If somebody his father runs a Kirana store, he goes, and he's like, you know, daddy, why are we, why are we, why are we not using chatbot for our, have a website? We can take orders over chatbot, right? What I'm trying to say is once you bring awareness of all the possibilities, this is one track. I think where everybody as a country, we should bring everybody to a level where they understand the utilization of technology, where can technology be used and, and, and they then take care of it. The second track is, I think, where, you know, uh, people like uh, 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 Dr. Mridula, and, which is the high, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, where people become experts, they become the developers of technology. So, you know, so there's two parts here. One is the users of technology. One is the developers of technology. And we need both. We need both as a country. We need both. We need the developers. We need the high education institutions. We need them. Because they are the people who are going to build the Indian chat GPT, okay, which I think the chat GPT founder was in India and he said, you know what, you know, they're so far ahead that, you know, no Indian company can catch up now, which is true, but how can Indian companies catch up? This is where I think government come in like a Manhattan project. There will have to be a big investment done into this. There will have to be something put into this for, for India to compete, right? So I think that's, that's my points there. I, I, I truly think. Um, you know, I think uh, we we have on the panel some fantastic uh, you know people here, and they're doing the right things. And but there are two tracks. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so so thank you uh, all the panelists. Uh, but we have a few questions coming here. Uh, I got if if uh, Darshana, uh, if you may permit, I can take one question, or we can take two questions. Uh, so I think. Um... We have attempted a very relevant questions. If I can see, um, you yeah. can take so whichever you feel it's important okay. to answer. Okay. Sure. No, I, I'll take two questions. Uh, 
so one is coming from uh, Seema BK. Uh, she is asking a very uh, genuine question. I think this should go directly to uh, Vijay sir, uh, Vijay uh, Thomas. Uh, that in the state of Goa, although there are IT companies, uh, however the students wants to go out of Goa for IT career experience, what must be the government initiate? to encourage the students to stay in Goa and boost their career? So it's a, it's a, it's a tough one. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing, right? So if you, if you get industry to flourish in Goa, people will stay for sure, right? I mean, so, um, so this, there's two, three ways of looking at this. One is how do you get industry to, to grow? Um, and I think industry has, has done reasonably well in Goa. We have not reached the scale of the pharma industry. In pharma industry, Goa hits way above our size in the pharma industry. In, in, in IT, we're not there as yet. But in, in India, 10% of pharma GDP is in Goa, which is way above our, our, our GDP or even a percentage of population. So, so similarly, can we, can we do something like that? I mean, it, it requires you know i think all of this coming together what what we're doing at uh, you know we need to get more entrepreneurs we need to get a couple of uh, you know larger companies to set shop i mean everybody says silicon valley formed because hp uh, you know put their first uh, uh, you know first uh, uh, operations in silicon valley so we need to get somebody to come in that's going to transform this right a, a, a transformative 100 100% person. 100%, 100%, okay. Vijay, I, I really like the out of way thinking, uh, out of the box thinking, uh, wherein uh, what I see here is, uh, you know, Goa has approximately 1,800 IT graduates passing out every year as against a 170,000 from Bangalore or Karnataka. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are comparing that way. We have to see whether that set of people is enough for digesting because that out of that half the people will go for looking at jobs outside Goa and will go for doing ME, MS, something like that. And the remaining chunk is what we as IT companies in Goa have to take. Mm -hmm. So that is what we have to make sure in a different way. Let's think like this today, instead of government telling us that you have to hire 80 or 90 percent of Goan staff to make sure that you know uh, keep the Goan uh, the, the, the the labor department or whatever it is you know keep them happy or whatever it is. I think we have to think in a different way if we have to really grow IT industry. Okay, sorry, uh, Sima, I'm answering this question, but uh, let me tell you this: you know, if at all IT industry has to grow, then we need to look at people outside Goa to come to Goa and work for the industry, not just rely on completely Goan people is what I feel at this point, because what you tell about pharma industry, uh, 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 Vijay, 80 to 90% of the people working in pharma industry are not Goans. <laughs> Vijay sir, you want to add something? Which Vijay now? Dr. Vijay Bajis, sir. Okay, so no, no just just a, a different kind of a thing. You know, there are two ways. Another maybe a different perspective. You know, why don't we change the game? Like, you know, so is it possible? Okay, is it possible? Like, you know, that we have niche industry coming into Goa. Okay, instead of like you know, the service industry, which requires larger numbers. Okay, we don't have the numbers. We are talking about one like Karnataka versus of thousand eight hundred Goa. Okay, we cannot compare. That's out of the question altogether. Okay, that's that's so. Can we now get instead of that? Can we have some kind of uh, R and D hub or those particular kind of uh, the the Israeli like you know, people are working in the niche areas? Okay, we, uh, I mean, and, and I think so. Like you know, that's what is happening in the higher education, where where uh, where the support has to come. Okay, for this kind of uh, bio incubators which are coming in, and I think so. Like you know, what the cry of of bits and all like you know that that we require to support that more strongly. Okay, and. Uh, how to happen? Okay, we have to have a, a like a, a a thing session on this. But 
uh, this is something when i was working for the uh, for an mnc like you know control at india we are we were in the switches you know the way in the 1995s you know we are developing the switch with cisco okay and i was involved with that particular project and my uh, vinod bhargava who was the inventor of the switch okay when he was talking with us he said like you know i like goa because it's like silicon valley you know that was the unique point where he set up here you know if we do not market this okay then i think so like you know we are into this rat race and there are too many big players out here like you know which will just finish us off the solution like you know whether you have to get somebody from outside then we are talking about a different kind of a uh, perspective you know there's a different kind of an angle to it which will come you know and that's very difficult to address okay uh, mangarish like you know uh, the, the the kind of a thing is that the social political kind of a space will get into okay but i think so the addressing is like you know can we get niche areas can we market what goa is can we move into like you know the it space into villages you know if you talk about what is the uniqueness about goa goa is you know there are so many designers so many nomads you know digital nomads which are there in goa we don't know about them you know there are so many israeli guys like you know who are great scientists there are so many russians you know when the russian was there okay so many guys who are coming into goa and they are great scientist great mathematician who has explored that particular area you know this particular thing i'm talking about because that's what we were exploring when i was the osd you know these are the niche areas which we have to maybe as the government give the platform maybe as the industry do it maybe as the uh, technology partners whoever are there okay try to do it you know another initiative the the, the kind of things like you know where t hub has taken you know, the, the kind of like you know if you talk about kite which is there in um, in kerala t hub which is there in telangana you know those areas you know these are achievable things they are low hanging fruits you know can we get that instead of just talking about it like you know let's initiate it here let's have it here. and that's what like you know what my honorable chief minister has backed me into by we are going to be coming with tinkering labs okay 12 tinkering labs we are coming maker spaces in all the talukas you know the, the whole problem is in education we talk about augmented reality i ask and i challenge maybe some of this particular uh, uh, even the faculties in higher education how many of them have actually experienced augmented reality i challenge this we talk about it we teach augmented reality but i ask a very straightforward question how many people have experienced yourselves nobody i mean i'm sorry somebody would be but a large chunk would not have experienced it why because i don't have access to it whereas you know why did uh, why did uh, microsoft bill gates and all those particular went into developing bill gates is because technology was around them there was this particular machine which was there they could experiment it you know why don't we take a maker space and that's what we are doing we have come up with a scheme now okay maker space in all 12 talukas give technology bring augmented reality have maker spaces have a program okay which is going to go to every taluka and i'm telling you you know what i'm saying is we ran a lot of programs on on the youtube live you know boot camps we ran you know who are the winners in boot camp people are coming from sange people are coming from kankon people are coming from uh, from uh, from balpoi you know these people have the taken this particular system for the first time you know it would be surprising if you go to our youtube channel like you know we have we run this particular pro- program called as a gyan yes. bites okay and we okay. run a program called as like you know big impact stories you know one minute short videos you know you will you will see this kind of guys you know the kids you know who are 9 and 10 doing superb stuff and where are they coming first time learners okay and they are talking about technology the problem is that whole digital divide is like you know we are not talking about bridging and i think so cares is a beautiful project by the government and i think so the next 5 years we have to stick our hands together and i call up the industry okay to an socm like you know to help us out because if we do not bring like you know more players coming and saying like you know yes we want to be investing for the next 5 years we want to bring mentors mentors will be associated with this particular school project you know maybe like you know this is what is required the call of the day where we get the niche industry why would industry come because you know it's like the 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 flower and the the bumblebee the bumblebee will come if there is flowers if your garden doesn't have flowers like you know, forget the bumblebee will never come in and don't expect honey to come in <laughs> I, i i think good good one uh, vijay sir Girish, can i say uh, something uh, yeah yeah please please so uh, you know um, i agree with you completely that the kind of protectionism uh, attitude that the goan government has and uh, maybe at the risk of sounding like this as uh, coming a bit from outside though now i am completely goan with 15 years citizenship here uh but you can now change your name ma'am from goyal to goal okay goal to <laughs> but uh, happy to do that 
but i feel that you know uh, when we protect like you said you know keep this much quota for the goan employees and so on you are actually just uh, keeping it keeping the well keeping everyone in a well uh, when you open to competition whether it is the goan industry but you allow the big players to come or uh, during covid personally i know lot of startup founders have relocated to goa keep you know those opportunities when they are competitive they will bring the talent to goa and then the uh, young talent here would also see that and learn from that and that peer thing would be more of a mentorship because uh, we had uh, at some forum we had this discussion you know like uh, dr bojis was saying about the mentorship program what happens in the regular routine of whatever business you are engaged in doing the formal mentoring to the extent that is required that commitment doesn't happen with all good intentions it kind of fizzles out so let us uh, you know uh, you need to have a system where you are gaining with the mentorship because they're just working with you you are seeing others so until you open it up until you open the economy to the challenges and uh, of course the government is doing a lot in setting up like a maker space startup hub and i attended a meeting where t hub was uh, you know some uh, v hub or somebody came to set up something in goa but uh, just uh, you know i think policies need to move from being so protectionist to take on the challenge and that is when the goan because the bright minds from goa they don't stay because the average salary in goa personally what i find is very low uh, which is forthcoming so the best people just move out so who do you have the ones you want you need to keep protecting them it it's never going to break out like that uh, there has to be a period of some kind of being uncomfortable and then uh, you can expect that kind of a growth if uh, and people want to be in goa not to get the talent which is in goa uh, or uh, they want to be here because this is goa so lot of companies want to be in goa just when, when you when you let their work life balance they can have absolutely so when you land in goa they feel liberated <laughs> yeah and i mean they are happier it's a cleaner place so many companies from gurgaon would like to be here so absolutely uh, we just have to welcome them i think 100% so vijay vijay, vijay thomas you like want to add something okay, just on that one as as uh, uh, dr mizula said you know in goa we already have people like you know delivery moved their their headquarters to goa but you know why is delivery not part of goa technology association right this is the questions i would ask we should embrace the unicorns everybody that's that's moved to goa embrace them they're they're in goa now and and and, and people talk about a creative class you know globally uh, you know uh, sectors that did well why did silicon valley well because creative people from world over moved to silicon valley right so if we can create make goa a magnet for the creative class globally to come then magic happens right so but we really need to be open to that and then goa has all the ingredients for that as if, and it's already happening but but it's not uh, we're not taking cognizance of that you know as a, as a as a as a state as a as an you know a community but we just have to say yes and and come on over and and digital nomads all of that kind of stuff i think we it, it's been talked about in in in, in bits and pieces but as a as a strategy and 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 you know if we embrace this really we can become the next uh, tel aviv the next singapore we can be the next silicon valley absolutely absolutely so thank you i will close this on this note uh, i am having more questions but i will uh, i have to stick to the time so i'm really sorry i will not uh, but whoever has any questions i would like to give uh, uh darshana's number here who, who you can connect and you could put up and i'll i'll share this across to the panelists and they could answer it uh but darshana over to you uh yeah i think this was a very good session and i i can see the questions coming up and the questions are just increasing so i'll ensure and i'll try best to answer this question and i'll coordinate with the uh, guest speakers Mangirish Salilkar sir, very well coordinated. So I would not waste more time. Sagar sir is here, our co-chairman, and our chairman sir is also here. So Sagar sir, I would like you to offer vote of thanks and closing remarks for this conference. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dasana. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, it's been a 
terrific one and a half hour for me, you know, to be part of this panel. Some of the panelists I know personally, like Vijay Thomas, I mean, uh, we've known each other from school. And uh, Dr. M <laughs> Hi, Vijay. And uh, Dr. Mudira Goyalas, I know personally. And uh, I mean, it's been a terrific uh, one and a half hour for me to be a part of this panel. And uh, when it comes to technology, I think uh, somehow I get an image of the Pied Piper, you know. Uh, in a sense, it is such a beautiful thing and it's music to the ears and it's uh, it's something that everybody can enjoy and uh, make their life completely uh, fruitful using it. But if you are not careful as to how you are uh, using technology and if, or if you are not uh, looking at where you are going with technology, I think you're going to fall off the cliff at some point in time. Uh, technology is something which uh, I think everybody has to be uh, trained uh, to use in a very uh, 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 very thought, thoughtful and uh, you know a guarded way. If it can be, if it can be used in that uh, way, then I think uh, you will you can prosper like anything in, in, in your profession and in your personal life as well. Uh, if you, I mean, if you look at the way the technology has developed over the last uh, two decades, uh, uh, and at the same time, uh, how uh, a lot of evils has come with it as well. For example, if you look at Google, or if you look at uh, Apple, the way they have uh, developed uh, over the last so many decades, when Google came out, everyone absolutely embraced it. Like, uh, I mean, everyone was happy using it. But, uh, and there were so many uh, users and there was so, it was adopted by so many individuals and industries, but at some, at immediately, I think uh, within a few years, the question of privacy came up and people were thinking, yes, I mean, I'm being tracked. Tracking and loss of privacy became a very big factor. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, uh, advancement of technology in terms of uh, a simple thing like, you know, uh, like earphones, at some point in time, we had wired earphones. Then we had, we adopted technology of Bluetooth earphones. And now the concerns are coming whether Bluetooth earphones are safe or not, and how much you should use them. Today, the, I mean, I, I've been hearing uh, so much discussion about chat GPT in, in, in this uh, panel discussions. So uh, though chat GPT has, uh, I mean, all the panelists have said they, they exploded today and uh, it's on the verge of, if not already, it's on the verge of replacing uh, Google on many of the, uh, you know, laptops and mobiles, as Vijay uh, pointed out. But even during the, even at the conference uh, in in India on Chat GPT, when where the uh, co-founder of Chat GPT and AI technology, like the company parent company of Chat GPT, when he had come down, uh, he himself uh, raised very pertinent issues of how Chat GPT is going to be used. And already, they, already, I think everybody is aware that uh, there are concerns being raised about uh, uh, how it is, how fast it is developing, and what are the potential uh, uh, usage of uh, AI uh, systems. So I think me coming from a medical background as well as a pharma background, uh, I, I have seen so so much technology being used. Uh, you know, in medical background as well. Today we have uh, uh, apps which uh, patients can download, and you know, you can can, can the doctors have developed their own apps. Uh, so uh, the access to doctors has become uh, so uh, easy for uh, patients. But at the same time, I don't think uh, you can replace uh, a physical examination of a doctor by by an app. So at the so. Uh, Today in pharma, pharma world, we are adopting so much of technology in terms of manufacturing, in terms of automation, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the machines. But at the end of the day, I think you still require uh, human intervention at some point in time to control the machines. So technology, yes, I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And uh, today, going ahead in the next decade, nobody can live without technology. It is going to be a part and parcel of everybody's life. And uh, it has been such a, a good discussion as regards how, uh, you know, we have to 
make technology accessible to students, make uh, may, uh, develop the skill sets. And a very, very pertinent question that I think one parent, concerned parent put up on how to avoid uh, or, or how to avoid students going out of uh, Goa and try to preserve them. Of, of course, that is a, opening a huge Pandora's box. So, I mean, I, I leave it to the uh, distinguished panelists to uh, provide food for thought there. But on behalf of SOHM, I think uh, I really would like to thank uh, our uh, IT chair, Mangirish Salelkar, uh, for organizing such a uh, distinguished panel to discuss on a burning topic that is uh, you know, technology and its adoption in today's society. I would, at the same time, I would like to th thank the uh, esteemed panelists uh, today, you know, each of them uh, who are stalwarts in their own fields, Vijay, uh, Vijay Thomas, uh, uh, Dr. Goel, uh, Dr. Vijay Borges, uh, Professor Manoj Kamath, uh, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I know so many of them. So they are stalwarts in their field and uh, Thank you all for being a part of the panel, sharing your such beautiful insights on the, on the, this uh, Pied Piper, which is known as a technology. So uh, <laughs> once again, from behalf of SHM, thank you. I think uh, with the number of questions rolling out, I think Darshana, you will need to have one more. Uh, all the, part two. Uh, one more, yeah, part two of version I think two, so, maybe so. <laughs> version three of this of this panel discussion. Thank you all, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a privilege being part of this panel. So thank you. you thank you everyone thank you thank you, thank thank you, you so much sir. everyone thank, thank you, you all the plan. participants thank you for joining thank you so much i'll end the session jai hind thank you thank, thank you so much thank you